This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus at the University of California in Berkeley. Do you believe in afterlife? Yes, I do. Why? Why? Well, it's not because of some sort of evidence such as supposed communication from the dead or anything of this nature. It's a matter of faith. Uh, well, is it necessary to make to have this matter of faith? I mean, to accept the the rest of the works. I mean, is, it, 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 I mean, is Christianity a package deal, or can you or can you pick and choose, or can you use the smorgasbord system of taking right. a little here and a little yeah. there? <laughs> All right. Why do you make this particular act of faith? I mean, what you believe you in life after death? Yes. Why do you believe this? I mean, not not just say it's an act of faith, but why do you take this particularly as an act of faith as opposed to something else? The alternative would be to believe in no life after death, to believe that the only meaning of life was to be found just on this planet Earth, and I simply don't find that ringing true with the best I know. You're limiting things to only two conclusions. Uh, this is what dogmatists have a tendency to do, and I'm, I'm surprised at you for it, Vern, because usually you're as slippery as they come at getting away from dogma. <laughs> the ability to see more than two possibilities, more than two sides to any question, is the ability to be an intelligent man. And I think you're intelligent, and most of us around here Keep think going. you're intelligent, <laughs> at least. So... Well, it seems to me that the, that uh, without immortality, without immortality, the whole the whole force behind your Christianity is lost. For that is, you have the idea of your loving, you know, the loving Father of all men, who's nevertheless you know going to brain you if you do something wrong. Now, if there's no if there's no chance, um, you know, if you're if there's no life after death, there's no way you know loving Father is going to get you. And so it seems to me. That, you're you're lo you're losing the fear element of Christianity, and um, you're just you're just left with people want, you know having to be good for its intrinsic value or be Christians for its intrinsic value. Do you think this can survive? I would say that goodness for its own intrinsic value is the happiest way to live. Right. Well, that man really has a response to this. That it is joyous to live as a child of God and a brother to man. Oh, really? That this is the best way, even if there were no life after death. That this would be the best way. People seem to have an innate, inherent enjoyment of goodness, of righteousness. Oh, well, they really do. Oh, it depends upon we, what they want. We hear a great deal about temptations to do evil, but I think within every man there is what you might call also a temptation to do good. That there's a fragment of God inside every man, and that man has the choice of to seek this divine will, this guidance, or not. And it's probably, I would say, it's the greatest choice that a human being does face. Inherent well, then, then joy in that. Then if you say, you know, the mer merits of Christianity stand on their own right as living as a Christian, why, why the need for afterlife? Then isn't this your action, aren't the actions on this world justification in themselves? Aren't they an end in themselves? They automatically reward or punish a person. That it's not so much a matter of a person breaking God's laws as breaking himself on God's laws. The way we were created to live is as a brotherhood is as one family, is as children of one father, and is as spiritual creatures. What went wrong? Is that a number of people have refused to believe this. I'd say the majority of mankind no, 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 no. has. Uh, when was there the time that people believed this and somebody gummed up the works? <laughs> I mean, who gummed up the works? Now, the book, you don't believe, I know you Individual don't believe people book, have the Adam. power to gum up the no, works. No, no, well, I mean, why, I mean, if, if that's the way we were created, how come... But we, there's never been a time when people did this. Right. Well, the simple fact is that we have this choice. Now, in the English language, as an example, we have a very interesting way okay, of talking about peace and violence. Oh, we okay. say, you make friends or you make enemies. This is the very choice that's before each one of us. The making of our relationships, the making of our philosophy of life. We have the option, one way or the other, to live in faith or not. According to Well, the only point I would make is that I see all men as children of God. And this okay. is a radically different way of looking at people, other than seeing them simply as objects or creatures to be used, to be exploited, fine. to be fine. treated not as brothers, as fine. many people seem to want You're to treat them, fine. but as children of God. Social Darwinism, please. I agree. Well, no, all right. Well, what about it? I mean, so we all believe why, that. We don't well, the point not? is why do you need a lot of these? precisely this, that we have 
<laughs> we have this choice of getting along with each other or getting along without each other. And by getting along without each other, I mean trying to blow one another off the face of the earth. I think the teachings of Jesus are relevant by means of spiritual power and the ability to love in a new way, a different way. People can live as children of one yeah, father and brother. Fine, Vern, but why? But why afterlife? Isn't this seems to me you're saying you're you're you seem to you seem to be slipping out of the issue? Why this accoutrement? If good actions are reward to a person enough in themselves, uh huh. Then. Why, why, why do you make an act of faith of afterlife? It seems to me I could go out right now and I could, I could make, make an act of faith of, of a permeating substance called fulgistin. I don't. It serves no need in me at all. Uh -huh. It seems to me if you, if you really meant that the, uh, that goodness is, you know, is reward in itself on uh -huh. this earth, that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't need need to make this assumption about afterlife. Well, this is an, in part an examination of the individual human being, of human beings as a species and as a genus. For example, if you go down to a dime store someplace and look at some tiny airplane in a child's toy department, you know it was meant to be thrown around somebody's living room, period. Right. But when you go down to the Oakland or San Francisco airport, and you look there at the planes, you realize that these things were obviously designed and were built with the idea of really going someplace. These things were made for the sky. All right, this is what I do when I look at man. I see a creature who is not just equipped for life on this planet, but a creature who was designed to live in the sky, who has greater potentials than merely material ones. He has this innate ability to see spiritual values, truth, beauty, and goodness, to live as a child of the Father. But you have yet to, you've yet to say why you think there is, to use, to use your analogy, why there is a sky. Why there is a sky? Yeah, I mean, in, in your, <clears throat> you, say, I see, you say, I see in man things that lend, you know, that he should, you know, things that transcend corporeal life. But how do you know that there's anything to transcend into? I mean, you, 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 still, have, you, you still haven't gotten around it. All right. A Psychologists are admitting the fact that the more they study human beings, get into such realms of creativity, of man's poetry, his art, his music, etc., that they're dealing with things that the ordinary rules of psychological explanation simply do not deal with, really. That there's something very much higher, very much different. Piaget, in his work, in Observing Children, has found that there comes a point at which they seem to make a spiritual transition in their early developmental... In their Careers, yes, I and think I, this might be explained. What'd you say? Another example is that is Langley Porter, the uh, UC Medical Institute, <laughs> is um, doing research data on on, on um, meditators, on for the religious med um, uh, religious experience. And another thing, right here, a graduate student I know in um, psychology is um, doing his PhD d um, thesis on um, religious experience. Professor Robert Elliott Hume of Columbia University has said that there has not been a culture, a race, nor a people anywhere on the earth who has not had some sort of religious experience, some sort of theology. Right. And I would agree with that, that there's a spiritual consciousness within man because man has the spirit of God in him. Even among atheists alone, in not believing there's, there's, a, there's, an, element of, there's an element of faith. See, How do you mean that? Well, in, in, they, they believe in not believing, you see. I just want yeah. proof. That if becomes can, a real... If can, if, Fern, if you can prove to me you're right, I'll believe you. <laughs> you have to understand, but it's beyond... I want, I want no, proof. It's beyond a subject, or, or I mean an objective proof, I mean, empirical you're, thing. What no, you're let me give you an is, example. What you're telling me is you have My no wife proof. loves me, uh -huh. but I could not conceivably get out a pen and ink and somehow in a mathematical or Aristotelian syllogistic manner prove that my or wife loves even me. A even a How could that I makes prove subjective sense to me? How could I prove that that right. tree against that sky is beautiful as we're standing on campus right. looking at it? Right. It's, it's simply subjectively known. It's recognized. It's also right. governed by your own particular criteria. Another right. fact I would base this all on, or another at least argument or distinction, would be the fact that human beings seem to have innately an ability to recognize goodness, truth, beauty, and love. No. Wait. Now these are not Hold simply it physiological phenomena, Holy these are spiritual. And it's because of this spirit within man, this divine gift of God, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God being within us, that we're able to discern these. Now, wait a minute. You say everyone has... Uh, how can you reconcile it with the, the so many different uh, uh, mores of peoples around it. the world? But that's just it. What he's saying is, is that we're able to perceive goods and bads. Well, yeah, everybody you know. One's definition words, of a good or bad may vary. May vary. Well, then it all falls. 
in my no, opinion. No. Yeah. Why would it You're saying, in other words, that everyone makes every human, every human culture has made, has taken, taken acts and, and categorized them into it good and bad. It more lies on, on acts. What we're also trying to say is, is that there are more people are moral. I don't. I, I yes, they have a spiritual inward ability to recognize this sort of thing. For example, well, a man I, over I in San Francisco is, is asked by a panhandler for some money. Someone. The man gives the panhandler a quarter and he says, I'm doing this because it makes me feel good to do it. And someone might wonder, then why not give him 50 cents and have the time of your life, you know, or a dollar and go into an ecstasy. <laughs> but the simple fact of the matter is, I say, a logarithmic curve. <laughs> that for some peculiar reason we do enjoy doing things that are good we enjoy helping somebody else we do the things we and we think are good and that's because we we're children ourselves. of god no and no, we're brothers no no yes no. yes yes <laughs> no i can't call it you say we enjoy doing things that are good right. this is because i can we say are, yes a lot right. and you can you, say no all right you can say yes all right that's a remarkable thing that's always impressed me about the story at least as we have it of the crucifixion of jesus his being able to say father forgive them at that point jesus knew he was gone I think that's another case. Maybe if students, if all people knew they were sons of God, they'd be able to live differently too, do you think? Well, Jesus threw the moneylenders out of the temple. He got a little angry. And it comes a time when so much can be taken. There's a, there's a point where you can't turn your cheek anymore. I believe the point that Christ had to show on that, though, was for, for money is the root of all evil. The full scripture, of course, is that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's when a person makes this really the treasure of his life and decides that he's going to have to have this or nothing else, that he forsakes spiritual values for the sake of possessions. That's the dangerous point. When religion becomes intolerant and dogmatic, it causes more problems than it solves. For a person to believe that there's this experience available, living as a child of God, finding himself to be valuable, finding a profound inward peace, which a lot of people have not found, not an escapist peace, but a peace which provides a person the ability to go out in the world fearlessly, without anxiety, and solve those problems. That's a religion which I consider to be very pertinent, which I've found myself. Truth and beauty and goodness and love cannot be defined. There's a whole realm, a whole spectrum of experiences which we as human beings know, and they're the highest ones and the best ones, which we literally cannot put into words. Sometimes I despair, being out here with a microphone in my hands, we're trying to talk about God and truth and beauty, and we know we don't have the words for them, and yet, somehow, spiritually, we're able to intuit these. And I believe that's because man has a spark of the divine within himself, that he's more than just how much he weighs when he stands on the doctor's scale and how tall he is when he stands up against the wall and makes a mark, that there's a spiritual side to man. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God, and to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, and Seven Principles of Prayer. Any or all of this literature, yours free, simply writing to box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address. It's box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day.